Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm Ralph Sexton, and I invite you to stay tuned for the next few moments as we bring to you a very, very special message. Don't forget coming up in, uh, later in July in Asheville will be the great Land of the Sky Jubilee, and that'll be at Trinity Baptist Church July 24, 25, 26, 27, and then closing out on the 28th. That's July 24 through the 28th, right here in Asheville at the Trinity Baptist Church. And then I need a special favor. Please put on your calendar, save the date, September 2, Monday night, Johnson City, Tennessee, right on the Bristol Highway. We're gonna have up the big, beautiful new tent, and that's dedication night. And I would love for all of you that can to come and be with us. We've got some of your favorite singers, Inspirations are going to be with us that week. The Wisnets and many, many others. Brother Arthur Rice doing the community choir. It's going to be a wonderful time together. September 2, put it on your long range calendar. Put it in your smartphone and let's plan to be together. And he went and knelt and had a prayer meeting, George Washington. And he asked God to help. And when he went back to the camp, he said, send word to Robert Morris and tell Robert it's over if we don't have help. We've got to have money, to gold coin to pay the men. We've got to buy supplies. And so when he did that, he sent word to the Secretary of Finance requesting gold for the men. And you know what Marsh responded? We've sold everything. We've cashed all the bonds and, and all the agreements. It's over. We're broke. And when that messenger came and told the general... Guess what General Washington said? He sent word back to Morris and he said, see if you can find Solomon. See if you can find that young Jewish man that's so gifted in finance. See if there's anything he can do to help us. And while that prayer was being given by Washington, God was already working on Haim Rich and Haim was there and he was consolidating his wealth. He was getting all of his money and he loved America for the freedom it provided him to be a Jew. And he sold everything and gave his own gold and packed it all up and gave it to Robert Morris that he could buy supplies and boots and ammunition to keep the army going. And after the war, ladies and gentlemen, because you know the rest of the story, America won the Revolutionary War. Obviously, we're, we're not British this morning. So well, we won the Revolutionary War. And after the war, Washington asked Hyam. He said, how do we repay you? How do we say thank you? And you know what Hyam's response was to the general? He said, just honor my people. Keep the freedom. Keep the liberty. But George Washington did something a little different. Here's the great seal of the United States. You see that close up of the stars? And what they did is they put the Star of David on the great seal of the United States. That every day, America would remember a Jewish man and his family that sold everything to keep America free. And George Washington kept his promise that he would honor his people for the sacrifice that they made. And we can sit here today and say, God has what? God has blessed America. One of the joys that you have in being a part of our great country is to know what a heritage that God has given to us. We are a blessed people living in a blessed land. One of the things that we often say is God bless America. Why we even sing songs about God bless America. And we talk about the fact that God has blessed America. I study a lot about World War II and I'm fascinated with how many times God intervened with divine hand, whether it was weather or confusing the enemy, that we would continue to be a free people. And if it hadn't been for the hand of God, I think the outcome would have been far different. We might be speaking Japanese or German today. But God intervened. 
And that's just in modern history. But if you study early American history, you see the hand of God over and over again. For our Bible study time, I would like to ask uh, this question to you. Is there a reason God has blessed America? Why has God blessed America? Let's get into the word, shall we? Take your Bible and look with me at Proverbs 14 and verse number three. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. If God has blessed America, we should not be proud of what we have accomplished, but we ought to be wise enough to thank God for what he's done. We ought to acknowledge our heritage. We ought to acknowledge our founding fathers. And we should acknowledge the fact that God has blessed America. Psalms 33 and verse number 12 reads, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. We know that in the context of that text, that God's talking about earthly Israel and the blessing that God has given to them. But we also know as New Testament Bible believers that we are the wild branch that was grafted in. The Bible believer of the book of Romans, the one that was taken and removed from the legacy of law and restraint to the world of grace and mercy through the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, Bible-believing Christians acknowledge that our founding fathers were those type of Christians, people that believed in the gift of God and the hand and the providence of God. Our faith is built upon the Word of God. And many of our founding fathers were men and women of faith. And what happens, we built a nation and how did we build that nation? We had a faith foundation. And that was what God gave to us. The word of God reminds us through these scriptures that we should not forget what God has done for us. Write down those three points in your heart. Remember that God loves us for God so loved the world. And then don't forget that no one killed the Lord Jesus Christ, no Roman army, no Jewish court could take the life of the king. Why, Jesus gave his life. He died for us. And thirdly, we should remember the faith and religious liberty that was a gift presented to us, not by my blood or your blood, but by the blood and sacrifice and the hardships of generations that said we're going to honor God and we're going to have a land that will be built upon the word of God. And that is the gift. Psalm 78 and verse number two says, I will open my mouth in a parable and I will say or utter dark sayings of old. In other words, God said in his word to those uh, Jewish people, you've seen the miracles. You know what happened when you cross the, the sea, then you know what happened when God put a, a, a flame of fire by night and a cloud by day. You know when God sent water out of an, a rock that there was in a desert land and no water to drink. You know the miracles. You know the stories. And he said in verse 3, which you've heard and known and our fathers have told us. Then verse 4, we will not hide them from their children showing the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he's done. Not only to the children, but that we would share them. Look what it's talking about. Read between the line. We will not hide them, plural. What are we not going to hide? The spiritual truth of the word of God. And then we're not going to hide the historical facts of our nation. Isn't it amazing how America has gone on a binge of erasing our history, tearing down monuments, pulling down memorials, doing everything you can to blight the, the founding father's name or to have their name taken off buildings that will not be remembered or honored or that someone will ask the question, 
Who is that man? Or what did he do? Why do we honor him? You see, we're on a, a binge to take away all of those facts from the historical side. And at the same time, we took prayer out of the public forum. We took it out of the public school. We removed the Bible from the public forum and from the school. And so with both hands, we're trying to erase the past, the spiritual path and the secular historical path. And then it says from their children, show the generation to come. We are the legacy. Every Wednesday morning in Asheville, North Carolina, we meet together at Trinity Baptist Church at 10 a.m. And we nicknamed our group, our Bible study group. What did we nickname our group? Heritage what? Keepers. Because you are the living legacy. God gave you the light. God gave you the truth. God gave you the word. Psalm 78 is saying you hold that sacred trust. You, got, you say, Pastor Ralph, I don't even have a child. I'm not married. I'm a single adult. It doesn't matter. God's saying that a part of the household of faith, when you become a part of Trinity Baptist Church, all these babies are your babies. It doesn't matter if you belong to the First Baptist Church or you belong to the Methodist Church or you belong to the Presbyterian Church. Uh, when you belong a, to a part of a local Bible-believing New Testament church, all those babies are your babies. All those teenagers are your teenagers that you would pray for them and then make sure that they have a heritage and an opportunity to grow up and to know about the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's three main reasons I believe God has blessed America. I believe God has blessed America because we have provided a home for the Jewish people. I cannot tell you how strong I, strongly I believe this. I believe with all my heart, God raised up America to be a refuge until Israel could have a home, until May 14, 1948 could come to pass. I believe God in his sovereignty said I'll have a home for my people in this little new country called America. I will bless them that bless thee is found in the word of God. Genesis chapter 12 and verse number three. Consider with me that after the Roman Empire, what did the Roman Empire do? They scattered the Jews. You remember the battle was there in Jerusalem and from that day until May 14, 1948, the Jews wandered the world with no place to call home. In 70 AD, General Titus besieged Jerusalem. And there he circled the city. He had landed his uh, ships, his troops, and his horses, and all of their equipment of war at Caesarea by the sea. They marched then from uh, the ports of Joppa, and Caesarea up to what we call Jerusalem. And there they began to go to war against the rebel resistance. The war had broken out in 66 AD or 66 CE. They, the Jews call it the common era. And, in, and that was because there was a great tax being placed upon them by one of the local rulers of the Roman Empire that was supposed to be administering that part of the world for the uh, Caesars of Rome. And he became very brutal and he began to tax and it became to be unbearable. And so they revolted in 66 AD. Well, Rome felt like they were losing, so they took their top general. They didn't want to lose control of Judea, Samaria, and the land of Israel. So they took General Titus and he did three or four important things that you need to remember as a student of history that you can understand what's going on in the world today. What did General Titus do? Number one, he crushed the revolt. And to crush the revolt, he killed all the warriors. He killed those that were in the battle, those that were revolting. Number two, he tore down the second temple, the beautiful, most beautiful building in the world. He looted it, he tore it down, and he set it on fire. 
And because the fire melted the gold and silver of the building, it ran along all the mortar joints. And when it did, the, it cooled. He said, if you want the gold and silver that melted, you can have it, just take the building apart. And that's how the prophecy of Matthew 24 was fulfilled. Not one stone shall rest upon another. And what happened, those Roman soldiers, to get the gold out, they literally took the walls down and took the blocks apart because they wanted the gold and silver that had melted. So they crushed the revolt, number two, number two, uh, number one, and then number two, they looted the holy city and the temple mount. This is Rome, Italy. This is the Colosseum. And to the right of the Colosseum, I was just there a few weeks ago, and here is what we call the Arch of Titus. And there is a, a covered on this particular relief, carved in stone, the victory of General Titus when he came back from Jerusalem and came back to Rome. Would you look closely at the drawing? You will see all the treasures. You'll see all the gold. You'll see all the silver. And what do you see them carrying there? The menorah. And that was out of the holy temple along with the, the cups and all of the artifacts of the second temple. And to this day, have those artifacts been recovered? Do we know where they are? Yes, we do. We know they're in Rome because here it is memorialized. It was brought in and hidden in the city. And to this day, there's controversy raging for that material to be restored to the people of Israel. There's two other things that General Titus did that are very important. Number three is that the survivors were placed into slavery. If you live for that battle, he tied you hand and foot and bound you and took you down to the coast and put you on slave ships. And everywhere that Rome went with a, a ship or whether they went with a colony, they took these Jews and they scattered them around the world. A lot of Jews hid. They went down to the Dead Sea. They went to the caves around Qumran. Some went to Judea and Samaria to the wilderness and hid out. There have always been Jews there, but they were hidden. But General Titus said, I'm going to put all of them. And he said, I'm scattering them around the world. That's called in the Hebrew, the diaspora, the scattering around the world. And then number four, listen to me carefully here. This is modern day history. He changed the New Testament name of Israel to Palestinia. To Palestinia. Have you ever heard the word Palestinians? He changed the name in 70 AD, the New Testament name of Israel to Palestinia, meaning that Israel would be no more. In 1516, later in history, Israel was captured and it was ruled by the Ottoman Turks, a Muslim group. And for 400 years, Muslims control the Temple Mount. For 400 years, Muslims controlled Jerusalem. There were Jews living there, but they were not in power. They were not there. The power was the Ottoman Turks, the Muslims, and they ruled the land. And then World War I breaks out, and part of the assignment of the British Army was to go into Africa and in the Middle East and deal with the Ottoman Turks. And in 1917, the British Army defeated the Ottoman Turks. And they set up uh, with the League of Nations what we call the British Mandate, that they would be the, the watchmen, so to speak, of the Middle East nations. And here are the maps. Here are the maps. And I gave you a copy of those maps. And this is the original map. And I want to thank Andrew again for making sure we got the best research. This map is actually a decommissioned CIA map. This was just decommissioned in the 90s. This is from the archives of the Central Bureau of Intelligence. The Central Intelligence Bureau, CIA. And you have those maps on your QR code and on the maps I passed out for you. And you can see what Israel was promised, 
with the negotiations of 1917. Then in 1922, you can see what they did is that the British became pressurized by the Arab nations and the threat of oil for the new developing industries of the 1900s. And they took away 71% of Israel. They took it away. And they gave it to a tribe in the Middle East. And that tribe was called the Hashemite Kingdom, a tribe. And that became known as the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And then in 20, 1922, it becomes what we call Transjordan. And then today, it's the modern nation of Jordan. Have you heard the talking heads on TV talk about a two-state solution? Well, we had that in 1922 because you'll see there on the map, we had Israel and that was for the Jews and we had Jordan and that was for the Palestinians. And that was a two-state solution in 1922. But we quickly moved through that and betrayal after betrayal and they begin to negotiate for Israel and it's called a peace of Israel for peace. And the last one for it, Listen to me carefully, put it in your notes, was 2005. 2005, the Israeli army went into Gaza and made Jews leave Gaza. That's right. 9,000 families were there with an agriculture industry, greenhouses, farms, employed thousands of Palestinians with world-class agriculture, drip irrigation, feeding Egypt, feeding parts of Africa, feeding Europe and Turkey with the great crops grown right there in the most wonderful climate of the Gaza Strip. And in 2005, as part of one of the peace negotiations, they said if you'll quit setting off bombs in Jerusalem, if you'll quit blowing up our buses, we'll, we'll move out of Gaza and we'll give that to you as a free state for the Palestinians. And that can be a coastline and a culture. You can develop it like Lebanon. It was the Paris of the Middle East and said, and you already got the beautiful farms and the jobs and the greenhouses, the tractors and everything. And the army, the Israeli families didn't want to leave. And we had to watch Jew upon Jew. Israeli IDF forces went in and made the 9,000 families move out and handed Gaza to the, to the people that lived there, and the Jews walked out. And what did they do the next day when the Jews left with all the beautiful farms? What did they do with the great greenhouses, the agriculture, the pump systems, the, the very things that had been invented to take sure that the desert blossomed like a rose? They set them on fire. They burned them because they belonged to a Jew. They burned them, destroyed them. And just 2007, they had their first election and they elected Hamas to rule over Gaza. And that was the last election they ever had. So in 1917, what happened? We have a British foreign secretary, Arthur Balfour, and he wrote a letter to Lord Rothschild, the leader of the British Jewish community, with a plan to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Isn't that something? All of that. And that's where that Balfour Treaty is referred to and talked about. And though there's a copy of the letter that he wrote to the Jewish leader back in London and said, for 2,000 years, the Jews have not had a home. They've had to wander the world and said, it's time for them to come home and a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. In 70 AD until May 14, 1948, no home for the Jew. Where could the Jew find a refuge? There were programs in Europe, persecution, the great Spanish Inquisition, the Iberian Peninsula, all of the activities of Germany, Poland, and France, all anti-Semitic, all against the Jew. And for 400 years, 1620 to 2024, you know where the Jew had to go? He came to America. He came to the United States for acceptance for freedom, from persecution, and a place to worship Jehovah 
in the freedom of his own heart. I can remember my dad as a teenage boy sitting with me and talking when I went through the films of the Holocaust from the War Department. And he had been giving them a gift during the war for the, the uh, bond rallies. And I put up the screen in the basement and put that 16 millimeter projector together. And I would watch those reels of our GIs cutting the locks off the death camps. And I'd see the Jews stacked like cordwood. I'd see the simmering ovens and then open the door and hold their nose with the burnt bodies of Jews, boys and girls, moms and dads. The unbelievable Holocaust and the horrors that Adolf Hitler created. And I sat there and I watched that over and over. And my dad said, son, I can't explain it all to you, but they're God's chosen people. They've gone down a road that you can't explain. We'll have to trust God. But he said, he said, you know, my doctor's a Jew. My dad went out of his way to make sure he found a doctor that was Jewish. My dad's optometrist was a Jew. My dad's lawyer was a Jew. You know why? Because he believed that that was God's people. And it was his little bitty way of saying, I believe in you. I trust you. And I trust the word of God. I want to thank you for being with us today as we talk about the land of the sky jubilee. What memories. Growing up at Trinity Baptist Church, a lot of you remember the all night jubilees, the Labor Day jubilees, the tent, the cooking barbecue, and hamburgers, and watermelon, and the refrigerator truck, and all the big adventures of spending the night on the campus. The old building used to be filled with air mattresses and blankets and army cots people driving in from Ohio, Indiana, all around the country coming to Jubilee. And I am so excited that we're keeping the tradition alive. I want to invite you to this year's Jubilee, July 24 through 28, right here in Trinity Baptist Church at Asheville, North Carolina. If you need additional information, you can call 828-254-2187. That's 828-254. 254-2187. That's the annual Land of the Sky Jubilee, Trinity Baptist Church, Asheville, North Carolina.